Goldman and Solar. One is the inverter piece, and one is the long-term resource adequacy piece. The long-term resource adequacy piece, I mean, you're not going to hit it until you get to 80 or 90 percent. So you're not going to hit it for a really long time. But it's a really big challenge. Unless we've got some kind of long-duration storage or we can really crack power to X and make hydrogen and other types of fuels, potentially, and be able to run a fuel-based system, um, that's, those are our potential solutions that we know of at the moment for this. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's exactly why our paper focused on this firm low carbon technology role um, was trying to look at, so I published a paper in 2016 that looked at energy storage in decarbonized systems. We went all the way down to about a 50 gram per kilowatt hour emissions rate, which was about 90% decarbonized. And at the time we thought that was like, you know, crazy aggressive. Uh, and then we started working on, uh, and then we started to see this nonlinear curve to get your point after the sort of 80% reductions, the cost of continuing to decarbonize starts to go up, particularly for the scenarios where we precluded any firm generation from the mix. We were just decarbonizing with wind, solar, and batteries, and then the remaining, whatever the emissions rate allowed was from thermal gas uh, as, your, as your firm resource. And we saw is as you tried to push the renewables and, and batteries, you know, further, they became increasingly poor substitutes for the gas. So in combination to storage, you know, battery storage and wind and solar became weaker and weaker substitutes for the gas that you needed to get out of your system. What you really needed was something that looked like a gas plant with no emissions. And that could be in our, you know, that particular study way had nuclear as the only option. But we realized this wasn't a nuclear story, it was a broader thing. And so the paper we published in 2018 on firm low carbon resources looked at nuclear, it looked at gas with CCS, and it looked at biogas, which could also be a proxy for hydrogen that's produced either by um, electrolysis or by steam methane reforming, autothermal reforming of natural gas with carbon capture, which is probably the cheaper way to do it right now. Um, and basically, we found that in all the scenarios that we ran under all of the different, you know, wide range of a thousand plus, you know, uh, technology and, and uh, regional sensitivities we did, uh, having a firm low carbon resource in the mix lowered the cost of a zero carbon system by 10 to 65 percent across that range. Um, and so if economics is what matters and if getting to zero, you know, zero is going to require social license and buy-in for the kinds of increased costs and spending that we need, paying attention to those cost savings is really important because if the cost balloon, we're going to stop short. And if we stop short in the electricity sector, um, I'd argue 80% is actually pretty far short. Maybe 98 is okay, but then um, there is some, you know, last little nonlinear bit at the, the very end, um, even if you have some firm resources, uh, that that's going to limit our ability to get to a net zero economy wide. Net zero emissions economy wide, which is now the law in Hawaii and New York, uh, the UK, France, um, and is uh, the executive order, at least in California and, and others. And I think we're going to be increasingly focused on this net zero goal. And that really does require pushing electricity all the way to zero carbon or even net negative in some scenarios if you have biomass with CCS. Um, so yeah, we need something to fill that role. Um, 45Q is helping a lot, uh, which is a tax credit of $35 per ton for carbon that's captured and used. Uh, and $50 per ton for carbon that's captured and s permanently sequestered without use. That's really catalyzing a variety of applications for carbon capture and storage, not just in the power sector, but I think just as importantly, or more so in industry. Um, this year, the two, last year, Congress pa passed and extended a production tax credit for new nuclear that is available for the first 16 or 6 gigawatts of new nuclear that come online. So that includes Vogel, which will take up a couple gigawatts of that if it ever finishes. But it leaves about four gigawatts available for the next small modular reactors or other technologies that are coming down the line. Uh, there's been RBE and others have been focused on long duration energy storage, which might fill this role. Um, DOE funded the forage program for enhanced geothermal, which is another technology. So the good news is we're seeing more and more investment in the technologies that could fill this critical role. Um, but we really need to ramp that up. And, and you know, we don't need these technologies now, but we need one or more of them to be viable in about 10 years so they can start scaling up uh, over that next 10 years so that in the 2040s they can play the key role that they need to finish the job. Can I also just add one sure. thing real quick? The resource adequacy metric that we use in um, the continent is one day in 10 years. You know, you ask people where that came from, and they, like, point to, like, some paper from 1935 yeah. where someone did a back-of-the-envelope rule of thumb, whatever. Yeah. And do we really need one day in 10 years when most of the outages no. occur in the distribution system? And at your house, you've probably had more than one day in 10-year outages. Yep. So, you know, we need to think about, do we need one day in 10 years? And am I willing to pay less to get two day in 10 right. years or 10 days in 10 years? So, you know, the level of reliability that we get, I mean, maybe we should think about, rethink what our resource adequacy metrics should be, what people are willing to pay for. You know, we have fast and slow internet. Um, I think that's good fodder for academic researchers. Yeah.
Yeah, the implied cost of non-served energy for a one-day and 10-year outage uh, rate is, you know, enormous, millions of dollars per megawatt hour, I think, way more than most people are probably willing to pay, at least at least a good chunk of the population that is price, more price elastic than that. Um, yeah, so I, I want to come back to the social license question, too, because that was also really excellent. I'll just plug Aaron Mayfield, who's in the back, is presenting at least one uh, presentation uh, here at USC that's focused on these equity uh, issues, which I think are really essential. Um, but I would love to see more of that in, in next year's uh, uh, panel. But I just want to go through the scale of the infrastructure build-out that we're talking about, because I think this really emphasizes the potential for dislocation in the economy that can occur and the real need to pay attention to these kinds of challenges uh, in terms of, you know, employment implications and siting, you know, when I think of social license, I think of those as two of the biggest things. Where are the jobs going to go and how are they going to change? And where is the infrastructure going to go and who's going to be okay with that? Because the kinds of things we have to build at scale, none of them are easy. There's no way around, uh, around it. So let's go back to the beginning here. So I focus my research on electricity because I see it as the linchpin in economy-wide decarbonization. We saw this in the Shell, you know, scenario earlier. We see this in this is the mid-century strategy uh, modeling for for the uh, the uh, Obama administration study that uh, PNNL did for the Obama administration. But electricity is growing in its importance in the in the grid today. Um, in the mid-century strategy that the uh, PNNL modeled out for the White House in two th uh, 2016, I guess. Um, they modeled a range of scenarios that would all meet an 80% economy-wide reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. And what they show in the, the lines there is the increase in U.S. electricity demand under a range of those scenarios. And so due to electrification, um, electricity use in the United States grows by 50 to 125%, so about half to double by 2050, even as total primary energy use in the country is flat or declining. So even in a developed, you know, wealthy country like the U.S., where energy demand doesn't really need to increase overall, the electricity sector might double in its demand. Um, and at the same time, we have to completely change over the stock of our generation. So the bars there is about our 2020 or 2019 electricity generation. The darker is on the bottom is gas and coal. We have nuclear and orange, uh, hydro, and then wind and solar and green. And what I've shown there is sort of if we keep the existing stuff around, assume we can keep all the wind, solar, and hydro, and that by 2050, half of the existing nuclear fleet sticks around to 80-year licenses and the other half retire, um, that's what we're left with. And so that gap um, between the bars, and then, then we see the phase out of, of renewables needed to, or sorry, of uh, coal and gas needed to be on track for the emission goals. That gap between the lines, which is the total demand for electricity and the stuff we already have, is what we have to build. And that's what this looks like on an annual basis under the three scenarios. This is the amount of new carbon-free electricity generation that we need to bring online. On the, on the end there, I give you the average um, annual addition rate in average gigawatts. So think about that as the output of a large nuclear power plant. So we're talking about bringing online somewhere between 20 and 30 nuclear power plants worth of clean electricity every year on average for the next 30 years. And I've overlaid lines in there for the total 2020 zero carbon generation, so what we have now in terms of zero carbon generation, and in red, all of our U.S. generation as of now. So what this shows is that to meet an 80% reduction by 2050 in, in U.S. emissions under a range of scenarios, we basically have to double our existing nuclear, ga our nuclear uh, wind, solar, hydro generation uh, by somewhere between 2025 or 2024 and 2030, right? So the next five to 10 years, we have to double what we already have. By somewhere between 2034 and 2040, we have to build the entirety of the existing U.S. grid in, in, in new clean energy sources. And then depending on how rapidly we electrify, if we're on the high end of that path, we have to do it all again by 2050. I mean, just think about that. We took, you know, 50, 60, 80 years to build out the current U.S. grid. We have to build out the entirety of that grid once or even twice in the next 30 years for new carbon-free electricity infrastructure if we want to meet that goal. So, hold on. So, is it really the grid or is it the generation? The, well, so it's the generation fleet and then the corresponding transmission that can, you know, link those all together. If so, right. Yeah, so, uh, exactly. So, give people some context. How much new generation is built each year? Yeah, let me, I'll, right I'll get to that. Yeah, so. those might feel. They, may, they, they are, and okay. there's some good news, but yeah. So let me, let me get to that uh, in just a second. I just want to show, this is a 80% emissions goal. If we look at a 100% carbon-free goal, which is what a lot of the politicians are talking about now, um, or a net zero kind of economy-wide goal, this is the Warren or Inslee plan, uh, the pace increases. 
And if we're talking about the Sanders plan, which is 100% carbon free, 100% uh, renewable by 2030, and phases out our nuclear fleet, uh, this is even faster. So just to give a sense of, talking about, it's basically doubling the US grid, or building again the US grid by 2030 to meet that goal, and then doing it again. So what does that mean? Uh, so I put these certain average gigawatt builds in, into per capita terms, or at least I, I put other build outs, the fastest 10 year sustained build outs of electricity infrastructure that I could find and, uh, in the world and normalized those to, to per capita terms and scaled them to the US population. So we can kind of get an apples to apples comparison. And the red lines are the range of additions, the 20 to 30 average gigawatts a year we need to bring online. Uh, and then the other ones are, are, are precedent. So uh, the smallest one is the US nuclear build out from 1980 to 1990, where we brought online just shy of 10 average gigawatts a year of new clean energy or new energy generation. Uh, coal in China, because this is per capita, it gets a little bit smaller than it is in absolute terms. If we did it in, in per GD ter GDP terms, it would be larger. But the one, the, the couple that really fall right in the middle of this range is basically the U.S. natural gas boom, the build out in the 2000s, where we built on peak about 50 gigawatts in one year and on average about 25 gigawatts, uh, average gigawatts of generating capacity uh, over that decade. So we need to do that again. The same as you know, the huge boom in natural gas infrastructure build out that we had in the 2000s, but every decade for the next three decades, not just for 10 years. Or equivalently, the French or Swedish nuclear build outs. So not totally unprecedented, but also not simple, um, and certainly quite a bit above our current build rates. So help people understand then where the renewables fits in. So the estimate from IEA, EIA is that there's going to be give or take 24 gigs right of new renewables in the US in the US in yeah. 2020. Yep. And I think our peak right. our peak historically was about 20 gigawatts if I remember correctly, yeah. wind and solar. So in average terms, maybe that's a third of that roughly speaking or a quarter when you think cuz these are in average gigawatt terms, so you multiply by the capacity factor. So that's maybe 10 to 15. So that calculation? So for bringing on 20 yeah, 25 gigawatts peak, but multiply that by a third for average capacity factor of a wind and solar combo, maybe it's a little higher than that, I don't know. So yeah, we're talking about, you know, that's about maybe 10, 10 gigawatts of average. So we need to be more like double or triple that to yeah. be on pace for this. So that's another good yeah, comparison. Well, you may have just touched on your last statement, which is you looked at the capacity factors. Yeah. But uh, once you start, uh, we see this now, we get a curtailment yeah. a good chunk of the year. So the capacity, um, factors, so the capacity factors are going way down. Yeah. I would hazard a guess that you'd have to overbuild a lot yeah. um, and pair it with storage yeah. to get it exactly. done. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're going to get to actually the build challenge <coughs> in, uh, in a few minutes because I'm, I'm going to push the panel about electricity at the center of a decarbonized energy system, which has maybe take Jesse's big, est uh, big estimates, yeah. large Should estimates, double them, and no, yeah. double them. Double it, okay. Or triple them, right? I mean, talk about industrial decarbonization. Well, this already had, those are high electrification scenarios. So the biggest bar there is, is PNNL's, you know, high electrification scenario for an 80% economy-wide goal. So if it's, a, if it's a zero, net zero economy goal, then it's going to be even further. further. Um, and we've got a study underway on that um, at okay. Princeton right now. So yeah, it would be potentially even bigger than that high-end bar if we, if we push it even further. So this, yeah. yeah, so I, I, I agree. I, um, this is what studies are showing. When we yeah. really electrify these other sectors, the transportation sector, heating, you know, yes, all the sure. HVAC stuff, and start to move into the industrial side of things, um, people are seeing that electricity growth is going to be like double what we have today. Yeah. And this is going to be huge. And electrification is, is a double-edged sword. This is really important. If you don't do this right, you make your problem much worse. So just think about like uncontrolled electric vehicle charging making the evening peak worse. We have to do this right, and we need to make sure that we <laughs> control these new electrified loads that have inherent flexibility, right? We need that yeah. flexibility from the transportation, from the heating sectors. And in order to get that flexibility, we can get direct load control, right? I can directly control it. I can send out price signals and you know, hope people respond. And maybe I can have aggregators or the utility and have them try and aggregate. But we need something out there to really control this. Otherwise, the electrification is going to make our problem much worse. And I don't know if you looked at the distribution system yeah. in this as well. The distribution system is our most underutilized 
infrastructure on the power system, right? That's the piece where we don't really utilize it. The utilization um, capacity of that is very low. And if you just think about, you know, like I got an electric vehicle, um, if I put an electric vehicle on an electric water heater, it would double my peak demand for the month. I mean, that is huge. If everyone on my block is doing that, yeah. I mean, this is, this is huge. And that's just, you know, two appliances. Yeah. So it's, it's um, a lot to think about if we do not control this stuff. We need to make sure that when we're putting this stuff in, we're rolling out along with this um, a plan to control it. And there's a good example, Holy Cross Energy, which is right here in Colorado. When people buy their electric vehicles, Holy Cross gives them a level two charger in exchange for the right to, to control it. And that way the person, you know, they, from the get go, the, the utility doesn't like set in some plan, you know, five years later after you're already used to charging your electric vehicle when you get home from work. Instead, from the get go, they're used to the utility charging it. I think we need more things like that. Great. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, finally, thank you. I'm Ray from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So I'm, my question is pretty simple about how we unlock the value of curtailment. Because in the past, some energy intensive business will build their power plant nearby, like hydro, hydro power plant nearby the mining sites. But since we have so much curtailment as solar power plant, is it possible for that huge curtailment to attract some business off the grid to move nearby the solar power plant? Uh, we recently did the simulations to deploy the Bitcoin mining machines at the solar power plant uh, in Taiso, and uh, it shows a pretty good profit, and so it can both reduce energy intensity for the Bitcoins and can also increase the profit for the solar power plant. Yep. But I don't know how you think about similar ideas or whether you see some opportunities in these sectors. Thank you. So it's a, that's a great question. I've been, uh, as folks who follow me on Twitter know, I've been throwing this question out or this challenge out to people on a periodic basis and trying to get good answers back. So I'll throw it out to you too. The, the curtailment thing is harder. It's harder than you think to find a technology that is suited to be run very intermittently off of free curtail electricity. Most of the people that I talk to that are, that are trying to figure out plans for developing really renewable hydrogen or running direct air capture on renewables, are talking about building dedicated wind and usually solar sites, you know, together at a high quality site and running their capital intensive, you know, uh, electrolysis system or direct air capture system off of that at a, you know, as high a capacity factor as they can get or utilization rate because all that capital, you know, is, is, the, is where the cost is. The energy inputs are part of it, but you can't afford to underutilize your, your capital. So if you think about it, if you have an electrolysis system that could run at 100% utilization off of, you know, off of nuclear, uh, you know, a 45 or 50% utilization off of a good wind site that's dedicated, or a 5% utilization rate off of curtailed wind and solar, you're now made your cost, you know, uh, 20 times higher than the nuclear version. So even if the energy is free, the capex is 20 times more equivalently. So the, the pitch is, what is a technology that is extremely energy intensive so that you want to change all of your operational patterns around the cost and availability of free energy? It's highly automated because you can't afford to idle labor and have them sitting around and waiting for the cost to get low. Um, and isn't so capital intensive that you can afford to run it at a low utilization rate. Right? So those things don't tend to go together, right? If you have something that's highly automated and highly energy intensive, it tends to be also be pretty capital intensive usually. Um, and so finding something that fits those bills is hard. And the only one I keep hearing is, is Bitcoin or uh, Bitcoin mining or potentially distributed computation, although it's not as valuable as Bitcoin mining. Um, so, you know, if you have cloud services computation, you could actually move around where those computations are performed across a network of server farms to places that have free electricity. Um, but I don't know if the economics of that works. So these are hard things to do. So people who think that we're going to make uh, renewable uh, hydrogen only off of curtailed electricity, um, really need to go back and run the math on the capital piece of the picture because just because the energy is free doesn't mean the math works. Yeah, I'd, I would just add though that generally even if the energy the energy component's free, the electricity is not free because the delivery charges yeah. Um, in, in fact, in California, the energy is the minority of the bill. The delivery charges are a bigger part of the bill. Now, you can get around that by having it completely dedicated right next door to it. Um, that's how you get out to it. But for people, if you're just tapping into the grid, um, it's not free. Yeah. Um, I guess I would add, to me, the win-win-win is if we could have carbon capture um, that we could power off of curtailed renewables. Yeah. Um, 
one of I, so one of the things I think is that you got to just send the market signal out and people will respond. So Arizona Public Service, in the middle of the day, they sell a wholesale trough hour product. So middle of the day when there's a lot of solar and California's got a lot of solar and they're trying to find a way to get rid of it, they're selling wholesale 500, 600, 700 megawatts per hour of this, you know, cheap or free product. So there are things that people are doing. You, know, you put the, under, the price signal out there and people will respond to it. In Denmark, Denmark, um, they installed 600 megawatts of electric boilers mm -hmm. to take advantage of negative priced energy in Germany. So, you know, people will do things if you give them the signal. Yeah, electric boilers and ice, uh, ice pre-cooling pre are, are two others that I've come back with from this, you know, this challenge. And they, they seem to be uh, low enough capital cost and, of course, very very energy intensive and what they do is basically just shift when you consume. So there are already technologies that are used at relatively low utilization rates because you're not going to be running your boiler 100% of the time or your chiller 100% of the time. So what, what you can do then is shift when you do it to the times when, when the electricity is free. Yeah. yeah, I know there's a company, uh, Ice Energy, I think yeah, it's exactly. been in California for maybe a decade or so doing uh, industrial commercial yeah. cooling systems where they, they actually just Make, freeze yeah, water, make ice, uh, make ice, and then they blow air over it and dehumidify it, and they cool the building. It's yeah, actually yeah. Uh, low pretty tech. slick, pretty cool, pretty pretty low tech. Um, we got a, a, about 15 more minutes. Uh, I actually want to peel the onion uh, only on one more place. Uh, I got a couple more in my back pocket, but then we'll we'll come back to some concluding remarks. Uh, we had a question around DER, and we've touched a little bit on it. But I think we should peel the onion a little bit because, Debbie, you made a passionate uh, call for more research and understanding of flexibility in demand in uh, distributed energy resources. I think that this ice energy and also thinking about how do you shift load on the end of the system is also really important. Uh, and Steve, you mentioned a little bit in terms of the challenges that come with DERs either in Hawaii or, frankly, in California. and. There's a gamut of, yeah. of both opportunity and challenge, and I think you know if I step back, you know we talked about digitization, okay, autonomous control, other elements of using smart control, smart systems, decentralization or more heterogeneity. I'll put it this way of the grid, right? We've gone from or going from a very centralized, centrally planned wholesale generation paradigm to something that's much more heterogeneous now. We don't know what that world looks like at the end game, right? Whether or not it's islandable microgrids or self-sufficient homes, or et cetera, et cetera. All of those paradigms introduce both opportunities and challenges. And so share with us some more thoughts on that piece of it, particularly, I think, from your own perspective, right? Because you have one which is challenging as the ISO, right? right. When you've got whatever, five or seven gigawatts of yep. distributed solar that you need visibility to, right? Right. Start well, there, then first, then. I when I I give a lot of speeches, and one of them is about the three Ds, which is these are trends that I think are big trends that are going to drive a lot. Yeah. One is decarbonization, obviously, decentralization, and democratization. Right. And those are the three Ds, I think, that are operating on us right now. And I'm with you. I don't know how the movie ends. Yeah. Um, but we are, at least in our case, we expect that to continue. And so we have to adapt to a more democratic, decentralized grid because the costs are coming down. Um, on storage and other decentralized technologies, and I think that people are going to move more and more to that. And what you're seeing in California is they're tired of being blacked out uh, because of the fires. So I think you know, California leads to lots of things, and I think you're going to see more and more and more of that. As a grid operator, it makes for a more challenging um, operating environment, without question, because storage is something that just curls the hair on our head not me, but some of our people. <laughs> because the problem with storage, we know, you know, on the Super Bowl day, we know what the load curve looks like on Super Bowl. We know what happens at halftime. You guys all go get in your kitchens and turn on all your stuff, and you do all these things. We know what happens on Super Bowl day. So loads here for have been very predictable. Now, inject a whole lot of decentralized storage, as an example, into there. We don't know how they're going to use it. 
Are they using it to arbitrage around the hours? Are they using it to cover, you know, their nighttime hours? What is it they're doing? So now it makes the the forecasting much more challenging for us. Now we'll we'll adapt and, and we'll we'll deal with it. But I do think those trends are continuing. Now also as a grid operator, we know that as those grow, I have seven gigawatts sitting out there, I got to do something with them. And we've opened our market for distributed generation aggregations to come in and look just like generating plants. And they can bid in and they can bid up and down and they can do all those things because we have to leverage those resources. Otherwise, we duplicate them on the big grid and it just costs more. So um, I do expect those, those trends to continue to act on us and I don't see I'm convinced of those terms, of, of those trends, and I don't see them changing. Yet. So you, you do it from an ISO's perspective. <coughs> what about from, I'll call it a, a DSO or a, quote, utilities perspective in terms of their business model, rate structures, orientation towards services? You, you can pontificate on that or anybody uh, else can. I will. Can well, let me just say this. I think the current um, utility business model is under assault. Um, as you have, and I won't say whether that's good or bad, it's just, it is. Um, and I think they have to think about what role they play. Even in microgrids, this grid has too much production and this, production, this one has less production, and you're going to want to change power. Pretty soon you're going to have wires out there. I believe there's a world with wires. Um, I believe there's a world with 60 hertz, and somebody has to maintain all that. So. Um, the wires will be there, and I think that's the business they need to be in. Now, it's not a volumetric business anymore. It's a services business, and I think they have to morph to that. And we can talk for 90 minutes about this topic, so I'll just stop there. That's why I, I thought I'd open it up for at least a couple minutes. Yeah. Jesse, you've been thinking about this as well, and you too, Debbie. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess maybe I would take a differing viewpoint. Um, because I'm here in Colorado and I think things are a little different. For example, we don't have the mandate that all new homes have to have PV on the roof. <laughs> um, here, there's been a huge push to distributed solar and then Excel came out and voluntarily made a goal of 100% clean energy. And why did they do that? Um, I would posit that perhaps it was because they went to the PUC twice and tried to get some pushback on net energy metering in some way, maybe a higher fixed charge, maybe some kind of better cost recovery for themselves, and they weren't able to. And so they said to themselves, what is it that the people really want? They really want clean energy. They don't want solar on the roof. They want clean energy. So if we give it to them, they're not going to put solar on their rooftops. So I think if more utilities start doing what, so Excel's on this voluntarily, uh, Idaho Power, Duke Energy, you know, people are starting to do this more, it might be that there will be some pushback against, you know, do people feel like they really want to have solar in the roof if their own utility is going to be 100% clean in a couple decades. Um, that said, the DER stuff is super important because it includes all the demand out there that we all need to control in some way, whether it's by prices or by direct load control or aggregators or what. And, and we're talking, you know, instead of tens of thousands of generators, we're talking about like millions or billions of lots of little nodes in your houses and, and everywhere. And being able to manage that is going to be extremely challenging. I mean, aggregators are probably our best bet in doing it under our current paradigm. But, um, you know, that may not be the way we go in the future. And I mean, NREL is doing some great research now on autonomous energy grids that are sort of looking at kind of a hierarchical cell structure for balancing authorities sort of as a way to manage all these millions or billions of little nodes out there that we're going to try and want to optimize across. I mean, maybe that's a pipe dream, but if we really want to get the demand piece in there, we're going to need to think about how we get at those, those nodes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just give a plug for the MIT Utility of the Future study, which I was a co-author on. We spent three years thinking about exactly this sort of set of questions, um, trying to think from scratch or like start with a blank sheet of paper and say, okay, we don't know how distributed resources are going to advance. We don't know if they're going to be better in 20% of the you know, context or 80% of the context, right? Is it going to be a majority distributed grid or a majority centralized? What we do know is it's going to be very different from today and that we have a whole new set of options available for the delivery of electricity services that are represented by a range of distributed technologies, which include two important classes, I think. Those that are inherently distributed, like demand uh, control, um, electric vehicles, you know, HVAC systems that are inherently distributed because they're the load already. 
security, and those that are modular and can be deployed at a wide range of scales. And that includes solar PV and battery storage and fuel cells, where you can you know, do small uh, kilowatt scale systems, but you can go all the way up to multi-megawatt utility scale systems at bulk level. And those raise some different you know, trade-offs. Um, I'll talk about those trade-offs in a second, but I just want to say there's really, I mean, we, we realized early on in that report that it really was a report about rethinking regulation. Because what we need, because we don't know what the competition should look like, really, and who should win, is a level playing field that's established by regulation and market design that allows the right technologies to flourish in the right places. And, you know, I'm not a market fundamentalist. I think there's big roles for policy to intervene in a lot of different places. But when we move from a paradigm where we have, you know, a few big investment decisions being made each year by a centralized utility to one in which millions of distributed decisions are being made every year about investment and billions about operations, you really can't do that unless you have a good regulatory market paradigm that allows all those decisions to be coordinated in a way that's good for everybody. So there are four big pieces of that that each got a chapter in our report. One is rethinking regulation of the distribution network utilities and their role um, moving away from you know, volumetric delivery to uh, performance-based regulation uh, and services. Rethinking industry structure and some anti-competitive concerns that arise as we think about greater competition in the distributed end of the, and retail end of the power sector. So if aggregators are a thing and they play a key role, they probably shouldn't have be subsidiaries of the distribution utilities that also control access to that market. So just the same way we had to rethink wholesale markets and structures and we, we uh, restructured the generation sector, we probably need to do the same thing in the distribution and retail and aggregation side. Rate design, which is just absolutely essential that we, we at least somewhere provide cost reflective rate signals to somebody. It could be an aggregator, it could be a retailer, it could be the end consumer. At some point, you got to give the hot potato to somebody and then they can decide, do I manage that on somebody else's behalf? Am I a sophisticated and price elastic consumer that wants to manage it on my own? Do I want to hand it off to somebody else to hedge it for me, either financially or physically by installing DERs? Um, all, you know, we don't know, and, and customers are all going to have different preferences around that. But if we don't expose somebody to the price signal, then the market won't segment itself in a way that animates that activity. And the final piece is wholesale market design, and that's what you know, Kaiso and others have been on the front, um, the forefront of, in figuring out how we open wholesale markets to a wide range of these distributed technologies. Um, I, so all those are key, and I just want to just emphasize, I, I, like like Debbie, I'm really bullish on unlocking the inherent potential of already distributed technologies like load control and EV charging. I'm much less uh, bullish about the potential for the scalable modular technologies like solar and storage because they face real trade-offs between, um, yes, you can deliver greater locational value by being distributed and avoiding distribution upgrades or, or losses if you're in the right conditions and you operate in the right way. In some cases, you can contribute to those problems. But, but on the other hand, the costs associated with those smaller scale systems are significantly higher. There are still real economies of scale to the installation costs of solar or batteries, even though the same modular technology is at the core of a 5 kilowatt system and a 500 megawatt system. And so a rooftop solar system might cost two to three times as much as an equivalent you know, capacity of a utility scale solar system. And so you have this trade-off between economies of scale on the one hand, which argues for larger systems, and locational value on the other. And if at this point, if the cost side of it is two to three times higher, then you need to be finding locations that deliver two to three times more value than the equivalent technology to larger scale for that to make economic sense. And it's pretty hard to come up with solar applications that deliver two to three times more value. Not impossible, there are certain ones, but that's a big lift. And the cost can come down. We can shrink the economies of scale gap in Europe. In Germany and Australia, it's more like a 30 to 40 percent increase in cost, not a 100 to 200 percent increase. Uh, and we can find ways to increase the locational value by better siting so solar and storage where they really are valuable and not just smearing it everywhere um, by, by improving the incentives and rate design. And so both of those are really important to think about their role. And, and more solar everywhere is sort of the general idea is good. It's kind of the general idea that a lot of policymakers have. So do utility scale, but also force everybody in California to, with a new roof to install solar, for example. What my modeling shows is that, and it's not that surprising, is that the more distributed solar you force with policy, the less utility scale solar you get. Because in equilibrium, in a long-run equilibrium, they are direct substitutes. They produce almost exactly the same profile and the same value. And so the more distributed solar we get, the less centralized solar we get. And so these trade-offs are very real and very important to think about for, as policymakers and regulators think about what incentives we want to create to align people's decisions. I'm just going to throw, thank you for that. I'm just going to throw one wrinkle in there, which is the 
value of feeling secure or secure power in outages because yeah, I think the long run equilibrium yeah. assumes the system's operating in equilibrium, right? And when it's not in equilibrium, that value proposition changes completely based on your personal values. So but I, well, I agree as well, but I, again, it's, that has to yeah. cover some portion of that yeah. 100 to 200 percent price premium, Absolutely. right? So if the, yeah. the grid value is 20 percent more, then how much more are you willing to pay to your pocket? It's like buying organic food, right? I pay more for organic food. I'm not subsidized in my rate design to buy more organic yeah. food. Okay, um, we're at the, we're at the, the last couple minutes. Um, just some concluding thoughts, a minute each or not even a minute. What are, you know, what would you like, cover to broad ground, what would you like uh, folks to, to walk away with? Uh, and if there's one question left, please get up to the mic. We're gonna make it very short, um, but let's go to some concluding thoughts. Do you wanna do those first? All right, we'll do these first, but they're going to be incredibly quick. Okay. And quick answers. Lucy Chu from the University of Maryland. Uh, we, recently, we recently have a study collaborated with the utility company in uh, Arizona to quantify the rebound effects of distributed solar consumers. And those rebound effects are actually not small. For residential consumers, we find 18% rebound effect. And for commercial, it's as high as 80. So I'm talking about a 0%. Yeah. Um, so such rebound is, is neither uh, socially optimal or private optimal because these consumers are ignoring the opportunity cost of consuming solar electricity. So my question is, are utilities or ISOs um, uh, aware of the magnitude of, of those rebounds from the solar customers? And if so, what would be the right approach to deal with such in opt or not optimal rebound effects? Go quick. Yes, we're aware of it, and it goes back to part of the conversation that we were having. What they're doing is radar arbitrage. Um, so that means there's inherent a problem. This is not a system operation or economics issue, this is this is how the policies are made. And there's a whole lot of distortions because rate arbitrage goes on. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Short question, Tom. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you've adequately um, taken into account future energy efficiency. We can build net zero energy buildings anywhere in the country. We are talking about electrifying transportation at the same time we're diminishing the individual vehicle ownership and usage um, in, in many ways with shared vehicles and shared transportation, Uber and stuff like that. And electric load hasn't increased despite predictions of increase over the last several decades. So. Um, are your curves really um, based on the on the right amount of net of, of total demand? Yeah, so the, uh, I'll defer to PNNL who constructed the scenarios, but the, fit, the plus 50% increase in electricity demand scenario is what they label as their high efficiency, low electrification scenario. So assuming very little, a lower electrification than the other cases, and I think a frankly unprecedented amount of energy efficiency improvement over the next three decades. But you'd have to dig into the PNNL study scenarios definitions to get a sense of exactly what they included and whether you think that's adequately treating it. But when I, when I, when I picked the scenarios, I tried to pick ones that ranged from you know, aggressive efficiency, modest electrification to probably less aggressive efficiency and much more uh, aggressive electrification. So that that's what gave that range there. So it's, yeah, it's, it's consistent. It's consistent with studies I've yeah, seen. I think other studies too. So even with even with again, primary energy demand in the U.S. falls in most of these scenarios due to efficiency. Yeah, also from the the final the primary uh, sorry primary to final conversion efficiency improvements from electrifying a lot of things. Right. Um, but but electricity demand is going to go up. I think the question is by how much. All right, let's do this. Let's do it. just a quiet, final quick thought rather than a lot. My, yeah, my final quick thought is first, thanks for putting this together. These are good conversations to be had. Um, but what, look, this is we're in a transition for sure, and we don't know how the story ends. And I think that's a pretty cool place to be, yeah. actually, because then it, it really requires leadership and, and cultural elements and things like that. And I think that's what's before us, and I think that's a cool place to be. Right, thanks. Uh, my final quick thought is that. Um, and getting to, say, 100% clean energy, the first big hurdle we're going to face is really dealing with system stability issues. If we can solve that problem, then the next big hurdle, I think, is really we start exhausting all our system balancing issues, that we, all our system balancing options that we have today, and really need to dig into that energy sector coupling, and really need to make sure we're dealing with electrification and controlling that properly. And then the resource adequacy stuff, that's really at the end. We have a long time to figure that out. We need to start working on that now, but we have a long time to figure that out. That doesn't really happen until the end. So we've got bigger fish to fry before we even get up to 80%. And we need to start working on some of these other challenges first. Yeah, I'll just 
friendly amendment to that and say we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. So uh, the I think the lesson from solar and wind is that, and shale gas for that matter as well, or I just saw a study of Canada's tar sands, is that 20-ish years of proactive public policy can take a technology from being a nascent fringe technology to being a central economic player in our energy system, right? That was the story with shale, where 25 years of uh, R&D support and unconventional shale gas tax credits and other measures made it economically attractive for some wildcatters to go try to figure this crazy idea out. It's a story for wind and solar where, you know, 30 years of sustained public policy support has transformed these technologies from alternative energy to central, you know, the cheapest option we have in most of the United States for new electricity. And I think we have to do the same thing for the firm generation or store, long duration storage technologies we'll need to finish the job. And if we don't start now, they won't be ready when, the, when we hit that challenge. We so, so we need to start, we need to do research, we need to establish the early market. Yeah, we certainly shouldn't slow down on wind and solar deployment. They're going to carry the bulk and storage, battery storage. They're going to carry the bulk of the work over the next decade. But we also need to set in place the policy and market conditions that create a niche, you know, opportunity for firm generation resources, not in 30 years, but to be deployed in the next 10 uh, at smaller scales, because that's what creates the experience and the learning and the cost reductions we need so that they're really ready to scale 10 years later. So I'll, I'll just say just a quick reflection is that um, wonderful conversation and landscape. There is a plethora of uh, opportunities and challenges and actually critical thinking and analysis that needs to be done to inform the next set of decades. And it's frankly not what we did in the past. It does require innovation in policy contract structure, technology solutions, market design, operations, et cetera, and it, we, we need everyone to contribute to that. We are only a, a few steps down the road, frankly, and we need, to, we need to start running even faster. So join me in uh, thanking the panelists, and thank you for, for engaging us. I very hope you. I hope you appreciated the style. Uh, very different, just an open conversation uh, without too much PowerPoint, and give us feedback. Hi, that was great.